Hey guys, welcome to the Titanium Vault. I'm your host, RJ Bates III, and today I'm here with my guest, Ray John. How are you doing, Ray? Good. How are you, RJ? It's uh, so good to be here. You know, you're a big guy, you know, as far as uh, the size of your body and also your business, right? So, <laughs> uh, Appreciate you, man. Uh, appreciate you being on here. We, we met what, last week at the Family Mastermind, so excited to have you on here and and share your story. Um, I think it's going to be inspiring for people to to hear, so tell us a little bit about what it is that you're currently doing in real estate investing right now. Uh, I do land flipping. Specifically, I buy and sell infill lots, and uh, infill lots is uh, just in the cities. You see a lot of houses. In the middle of it, there's uh, land. That's what I do. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's go back to the beginning because I know you have a a story to tell here. So how did you, first and foremost, how did you get to the United States and kind of tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I just came from Mexico. Well, no, just kidding. Uh, I, <laughs> I, was, I went from the, the university and then um, I started to, you know, go to university, but it wasn't my, my, my specialty, I guess. I failed two universities. So I started to do business inside the school and, uh, you know, I became homeless, but you know, after three months I was making about $10,000 a month already. Oh, yeah. That, that was quick. How'd you go from homeless to, to be able to make $10,000 a month? Yeah, it was hard. I was living in the car and, uh, I was in Hawaii though, you know, to be a homeless is pretty easy there. You know, yeah. you go to the beach and take shower. That's it. Right. And, yeah, I mean, if I'm homeless, I, I would move to Hawaii first, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then I started to flip all this free stuff, right? And uh, grab the things on the uh, Craigslist, Facebook. There's people giving out free stuff. I just flip them. And then I flip cars, right? So that's how I got started. So you've always been a flipper, no matter what. You're, you're flipping something, free stuff, cars. What Absolutely. eventually led you to, to real estate? So I've been trying real estate for a long time. So I took the profit from cars, uh, flipping, and then I try different niches, right? I try houses and then locally in Hawaii, it was hard to do. And then I do virtual houses. I wasn't smart enough to figure figure it out like you, you know, you do a virtual (laughs) flipping houses, right? And uh, then I tried that out. That that doesn't work very well for me. And then I started to do apartments, right? So all these things took me about six years, about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand in mentorship. All I paid all these guys, and uh, eventually I started to do land flipping when I was in Hawaii, and that clicked. And you know everything else uh, just uh, come after that. What do you think about single families and multifamily? What about that didn't work for you? What was it like the rehab cost? Was it just talking to sellers? What about it was difficult for you? I guess um, I just couldn't figure out all the different pieces and put them together. And, uh, you know, virtual wholesaling, if you don't have a big team in the in the lo- in that location, it would be very hard to do, right? So right. I think mainly is the mental block. You know, for you is easy because you think it's easy. You figure out how to do it, but for me, it was extremely hard. I was like lost, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I think a lot of times whatever we just aren't accustomed to becomes like like you said this mental roadblock. And and I have a lot of questions to you about the the land that you're doing because I think that is something that is not taught enough, and and it can become a roadblock for people that are used to doing single family homes. Right? Mm. We're so used to having to do these walkthroughs and get pictures and understand the rehab costs. And you're like, hey man, well I'm picking up this land and I'm I'm able to move it pretty quickly. That can be a roadblock for us. So. Absolutely. When you, what was it that like led you to vacant land? Because that's, you went from, hey, trying single family to multifamily and then back to, to dirt. How, what led you to, to that? Was it a mentor of yours or something like that that kind of led you back to that? Yeah, I paid a guy 70000 70, to t- teach me how to do land. And he taught me nothing but to flip land on terms, meaning you buy a land and sell on terms. That was right. that, that was exactly what I hate the most, right? 
So I was like, is there a better way that I can get my money back? I asked for a refund. That was a no. And and then I was like, you know, I gotta better get my money back. So I what I did was I go to his group and uh, I just asked him, what area do you guys want to buy land? Right. Because there is a lot of term investor guys. Right. So what I did was I find out the area. I start to market to those areas and then I buy a land for a thousand, sell them to twenty five hundred, three grand. I did about 250 of them the first year just doing that oh wow yeah that's crazy that, that's a lot of transactions right there uh yeah. so mainly in the cities infill lots like you said those are the the lots in between other buildings inside the city areas um but you weren't doing it on terms these were all cash transactions is that correct Oh, cash. Yeah, I like uh, the feeling of cash, the smell of it. You know, <laughs> if I want to collect a hundred, uh, if I if I were to collect a hundred fifty dollar per month selling a land, you know, that's not what I want to do. And there's a lot of tire kickers too. You know, the people ask you, "Is this land available?" You say yes, and they are not available anymore. Right? They're gone. Right? right? Yep. Yeah. So let's go to specifically the what you're doing right now with the the infill lots. Is it is there a specific type of marketing that you're doing to get these, or is it the same kind of marketing that we're all doing with like direct mail, cold calling, text, and things like that? Is that still does that work with these info lots? Absolutely. So I do direct mail, but the uh, difference is uh, I do direct mail with an offer. So I offer about forty to fifty five percent on the value of the land. And when people get back to me, I'll negotiate again. So that's like a double kill, right? So, and, uh, you know, typically we can get like land super cheap. And when we actually sell it, we tend to sell it cheaper than anybody else as well. So that's why it's easy for me to sell it. I see, I hear people all the time. They say, I don't do, do, don't do land flipping because it's easy to buy, hard to sell. Yep. I think, I think they just don't know how to do it. Right. So how are you coming up with the offer amount prior to sending the marketing? I mean, is there a system that does that for you? Is it based off the tax assessed value or how are you coming up with that? Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, uh, effort. It's take about two hours to make a list that has about 5,000 or 10,000 names. I explained that specifically with Joe McCall. Uh, we have a Joe McCall. Um, podcast uh, together and then i explain to him how to do it but it's basically uh based on subdivisions so we figure out what is the sold price uh average for that particular subdivision and then we offer about 40 to 55 percent gotcha of yeah. that sold price and then when you're selling it are you still selling it at a discount from that sold price or is that what you're selling it for yeah, we offer 40 to 55% and then we negotiate. And then uh, if the land worth 10,000 or everybody else is selling for 10,000, I would just post it for 8,000. Nice. Right. And yeah. are you specifically trying to dispo these deals to other investors or even particularly like maybe an owner occupant that wants to build on the vacant land? Yeah, so that's what I love about land. When I actually sell it, I don't need to worry about it, nothing, because I can just give it to the realtor and the realtor will sell it for me. And uh, mainly the majority of the buyers are builders. And uh, so uh, market selection is very important. You have to find a market that people actually, more people moving in is growing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, end buyers. And, you know, that's why I love land flipping. You can do it multiple markets at the same time, you know, without right. worry about the roof, the toilet. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. So how are you determining those markets, though? Because there's a lot of markets across the United States that are growing. How are you saying, hey, these are the specific subdivisions that we want to go into? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. So let's say you live in Dallas, right? So... Uh, I would um, check out what, what is a major city in the States. Major city means if I talk about Texas, you think about Dallas, right? You think right. about Houston, you think about Austin. So uh, first of all, we do not go to those markets. Those markets are highly competitive and you have to mail more, you have to offer a lot more to get a deal. 
And uh, so from that, from then we find a major growing city and we go outside about 30 minutes to two hours away. And uh, that's the range. And right. then we want to find out a particular county that in the last three months, it has about more than 40 to 50 sold particular for land. And that's our, our goal to find a, a county. So for example, Dallas County, um, outside there's Henderson County, there is uh, other counties, I forgot the name, but you know, right. I just finished a deal in Henderson County. So not too far from Dallas, you know, but it's easy to sell as well. Gotcha. So kind of going out in those little bit rural in comparison to, you know, Dallas proper, right? Yeah. That, those are kind of the ideal places. Like, for example, here in Fort Worth, I'm thinking of like Parker County where Weatherford is, where mm. it's like a 30 minute drive to downtown Fort Worth. Is that kind of the ideal place where it's, it's growing a little bit, but it's just a little bit outside of the major city? Absolutely. And uh, we want those areas not too rural either, because the rural, the completely rural area sometimes is hard to do the the comparables. Nobody is selling. You don't know how much the land is worth. So that might be a risk. Gotcha. Yeah. And when you say the realtor is selling it, are you listing it on the MLS or are they just like presenting it in front of their, their known buyer base? Uh, they do that first, and then if nobody buys, we just post it on the MS. Gotcha. Right? Yeah, I actually buy the land myself without uh, the contract. I don't do wholesaling. I just buy and sell because I think uh, cash has power. That's the first thing. And also, if you have a lot of uh, markets, that's hard to to build a cash buyer list for each market, right? Right. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, some of my experiences with with vacant land in the past, like I just say the past 12 months and and see if this is a thing that you've kind of encountered. I've seen a lot of, well, we've had, I know of four where vacant land deals where the seller was fake. It was a fraud. Is that something that you're seeing is becoming more and more prevalent? with vacant land where people are pretending to own the land, but they're not even the the seller. They don't even own it. Is that something that you're seeing? I don't see that a lot, but there was some, and uh, I was talking to a guy and uh, his name is Manu and uh, his dad name is exactly the same as his. Yeah. So I was like, you know, is there a problem here? Because, um, on the deed, it says he bought it in 1961. And this guy is clearly like 30 years old. Right. And, and uh, maybe he misreported his uh, age. But I, I said, you know, this kind of looked like sketchy. So I, I went to a title company and I had them close it. And uh, surprisingly, they closed on it. And I tried to sell it. And then the buyer agent find out uh, this same problem. And he said, you know, uh, we cannot sell this land because there's a problem. So I went back to the title company. We find out the underwriter in the title company didn't even catch that. Right. So I got my title policy there and I got my money back. But the thing is, there is people out there trying to scam people. So there are two ways people normally scam you. Uh, the first one is they try to be the seller. And second one is they try to pretend they are the title company. And uh, let's say an agent in the title company, when it's time to close, the agent go home and send you another different routing number for you to wire the fund. Yeah. So it's extremely important before you close the deal, call the title company, make sure that's not a cell phone, it's an office phone. And you talk to the owner or the manager there and make sure that the wiring instruction is, is clear, you know? Yeah, what we've run into was the pretending to be the seller. Um, some of these were people like inbound leads that came to us. So that's kind of a difference between outbound and inbound marketing, right? You're doing outbound with direct mail. You're reaching out to the sellers. I think with us running like PPC ads, Facebook ads, things like that. A little bit more prevalent for the scams where people are like, hey, yeah, I own this five acres over here in Fort Worth, Texas. Do you want to buy it? And they don't even own it. 
Um, I don't know how they think they're going to get away with it because we close everything. They're a title company. I think they're just mm. hoping that we're not going to, you know, do the checks and balances and do it the right way. Um, now let's do you run into scenarios? Cause I know this is vacant land is, is prevalent for being sold on terms. Do you run into that where people only want to sell on terms and it's kind of a struggle for you to want to do the deal in cash or is that not an issue whatsoever? Uh, it's not an issue because I don't buy them. So that's, <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so there are three things related to real estate. There's equity, how much the landowner wants to sell the land for. If they want more equity, there's no profit for you, right? And there is um, also speed, how fast the landowner wants to close the deal. And there is also cash, how the landowner prefer to get paid. So there are three things. Typically, the landowner can only get two of them, not all three of them. So what we typically focus on the sellers is to try to find sellers who actually want to sell the land fast with cash. So then we provide a solution that we can close the deal very fast with cash and then you better give me some equity. So uh, if they want term, uh, terms and, uh, you know, typically that's not what we, we focus on. Gotcha. What about like the the bigger land deals where it's not an infill land or, it, or infill lot? Are you just passing on those where it's like someone says, hey, I, I don't want to sell that quarter acre lot, but I've got 10 acres. Is that something that you're moving into or are you kind of just very hedgehog focused on I'm only doing the infill lots? Yeah, I try to buy them. And first of all, I try to see if there's similar lots sold nearby. Let's say there's a land, 10 acres nearby sold for 100,000. Maybe I'll offer half of that, right? And see if the seller want to uh, sell it. And uh, the more the acre goes, let's say the bigger the acreage, uh, typically the average acre per um, value drop as well. Right. So we try to um, find if there's similar lot because uh, land, I don't want to gamble and uh, I want to make sure that I make a profit. So uh, we highly focus on if there's similar lot sold nearby. Gotcha. Are you keeping any of the land or are you only flipping it? I keep some of the, the best ones and uh, also the best areas. So, for example, I live in Jacksonville when I first moved here. Uh, it, it was growing, but still is growing very fast in the recent two or three years. So when I first came here about two years ago, I bought all this land uh, for about half of the value by then. But right now, the value tripled. So I got at least 600% return on there, right? So that's why I go to areas I find out is growing very fast, like Jacksonville not like to Dallas there yet, right? Right. So I, I just keep them. What is like the average, like you, let's just use the Jacksonville lots that you're talking about right there. What is like the average value of that lot that you're buying right there? Because maybe someone doesn't know and you're talking about, hey, you're using your own cash to take this down. Is it something that, hey, if someone's sitting on like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 that they, they could get started? What is like the the prices we're talking about. Absolutely. The first land I bought there was uh, in Jacksonville is 2,500, you know, now the land worth about 25 grand, right? So you can get started with land. The barrier of entry is very low, right? And my first land, I bought it for a, a 1,000, right? right? Yeah. So that's a huge increase in value. Is that, is that something you're seeing across the United States, or is that specific only to Jacksonville? Yeah, that's why I love America. So America's economy is divided, meaning every state seem to be different. And every state is no better than other states. You cannot say Texas is better than Florida. Maybe for you it is, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just uh, look at equally. That's why, you know, people say is. Uh, we have freedom here, but in, let's say I'm from China. In China, I, you know, there's only some cities that are super majority, like super popular, like Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, you know, and uh, if you go to other small cities, it's hard to grow, right? 
But in the States, uh, you know, for me, when, you know, I teach my students when you um, pick a market, make sure that there are more people moving in that states than moving out. I probably won't go to New York to try to find the land, right? Yeah. Because a lot of people are losing, you know, like going outside. Yeah, yeah, that was I. Not to get political on it, but I do see a lot of the growing states, the markets that you're talking about, are the conservative states, you know, and a lot mm. of the states that are struggling are those liberal states. I mean, even in the markets that you know we work in all 50 states, but California, New York, New Jersey, these are some of the most difficult locations to even get a transaction across the finish line. Uh, yeah. You know, some of them being attorney states, that is a problem that we're dealing with. So I absolutely agree, especially if you're going to have like this niche down of a, a strategy. You have the opportunity to go to so many markets that are just amazing to work in, like you're talking about Florida or Texas, two mm -hmm. of our highest volume states of all time. Texas being number one and Florida being the fourth highest volume state that we've ever done deals. So I... <laughs> Absolutely. You're you're right. I, I do love Texas more than Florida, but it's not <laughs> where I live. Um, you know, Florida being a great market for us. I'm surprised though that Jacksonville, because the that the house, like an actual house uh value is not that high in Jacksonville. It's one of the lower uh yeah. valued markets in the state of Florida. What do you think is causing the, the rise in the value of the land there? Is it just hey, we're running out and that's why it's so valuable? Uh, you know, all real estate is the same. It follows uh, people, right? And people follow by uh, employment, right? And yeah. in Jacksonville, we have the, I think, number top three, the population here. We have over a million people here, right? So a lot more people coming in. Of course, they want to find a house and the builder want to build a house and then they didn't need a land, right? So here you go. And uh, Another thing I was thinking when you're talking is about attorney states, right? So I would be really careful to pick a cheaper markets to flip land in attorney states. So I had uh, just closed two deals. I was so proud of it, but now I'm not so proud. So I bought the land for a one dollar in uh, Georgia. Yep. You know what can you lose on one dollar, right? After all the attorney fee. It was 1900 Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, all these fees add up. So don't choose the cheap markets in, um, in attorney states. Otherwise, you might get screwed by the attorney fees. Yeah. And, and even on those kind of things, it's like, well, what is the reason why I'm buying something for $1? Right? There has to be a – that's like an alarming number where it's like, there's a reason why someone's giving me this for a dollar. It's like when uh, – this is uh, – my my uh, Achilles heel right here. Um, I talked to a seller and they're like, I'll sell you my house for 5,000. That's like my magic number where I feel like 5,000 is such a low number. You can't really negotiate them down. And those mm -hmm. are always the deals that are the hardest to sell. Because <laughs> it's like, no, there was a reason why they were trying to give you that for $5,000. Absolutely. Uh, so what, I guess, let me ask you this. With what you're doing right now, what is like your end goal with with your strategy is it to eventually to own a bunch of land is it just to continue doing what you're doing for the next 10 15 years like kind of walk me through what your vision is moving forward for you yeah my vision is very simple to own a whole bunch of money <laughs> 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 right so for me land flipping is like a cash call for me it's not a way to build cash flow Right. You know, be, because you know, you can you can barely rent it out. Who will rent a, a land, right? Right. Very very few people do. So I would take the cash and then I invest in multifamily. That's my goal. So multifamily, um, you know, you buy a building, you have a lot of doors inside, and eventually you get uh, financial freedom from that, right? So if you try to build a cash flow out of land, that'll be extremely hard. You know? So are you? Uh... Are you partnering with someone that does multifamily or have you are you going to venture out in that and, and give it a swing for a second time to try to do it yourself? Yeah. So I always uh, try to pay to get advice first. Right. So there's a guy in our group. His name is Gino. Gino. Yeah. Jake and Gino. He just joined the group. 
and uh, I just pay him, and I'm gonna learn that uh, game in November. So you know, I'm gonna just uh, see if I can uh, dominate him. You know, maybe <laughs> replace him. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh, just uh, get some uh, multi-family there. Yeah. Are you doing all of this by yourself, or have you built that a team at this point? I have a big team. I have one guy wor working for me in somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I pay him two dollar an hour. That's about it. So land flipping is extremely easy. You don't need a big team, right, you know. And uh, I have one VA. That's about it. So you send the mail out fifty percent of the value. They call you back, and then at that point in time, you're just negotiating. You pretty much don't even have to look it up because you know, hey, if you offer five grand, the property, the land is worth 10. So you don't even have to look it up. You're just negotiating at that point based off knowing it's worth 10 grand, right? Yeah. So when you go, when I negotiate, I try to buy, I get the best I can. I don't look at the land value anymore, right? So that's what I, I tell people all the time. When you negotiate, don't have a number in mind. Because with houses, there's a mile number, uh, maximum allowable offer. Yep. Uh, but for land, you know, you just try to do the best you can. Maybe you can get the land surprising low, you know, maybe even better than 20% of the value, right? Yeah, because if you're basing it off a of tax assessed value, um, I mean, to be honest with you, that's normally low. So you're getting it for if you're getting it less than that. I mean, like you said, you you could be getting it for 20, 25% of its actual value. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, I, I love land deals like that where, Hey, you're, you're negotiating. You already know you're in a winning position at that point in time. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of, uh, people, uh, has a lot of emotional attachment with houses, but not with land, you know? Sometimes they do have emotional attachment towards their land, but it's negative, right? I hate my land, right? Those kind of emotions. <laughs> exactly. How long? I, I got a question for you because you're you're very to the point. You remind me of me a little bit in that regard. Um, when you're on the phone with a seller and you're negotiating this, how long do you think your conversations are? Because there's not a whole lot to talk about, right? Yeah. So are, you, are your conversations pretty quick as far as closing deals? Yeah, you are the master of it. I watch you talking to sellers all the time. <laughs> I think I should start doing that as well. But I typically try to stay under 10 to 20 minutes. I want to find yeah. how motivated they are, right? If they are not motivated to sell the land, I'll see you later, right? But I don't have time. <laughs> <right? laughs> if you are motivated, let's talk about family first. I love it. I love it, man. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you, you, so you you go to school, you become homeless. Sounds like you're only homeless for like three weeks, but now you're you're raking into cash. You said, "Hey, land flipping has become a cash cow." You're gonna get into multifamily. I mean, is that something that you see yourself? Because I I used to ask mm. this question all the time, like, "Hey, in five years, where do you want to be?" you still want to be land flipping five years from now or does it want to be like hey you you kind of graduate away from land flipping to primarily just be focused on the multifamily at that point yeah so um one principle to make a lot of money is to catch the trend right so if the trend is against you it's very hard to make money and if the trend is you know in china we talk about this if you the trend is with you a pig can, can fly Right. So uh, we want to be the pig in the trend. So now I'm flying, <laughs> not because I'm it. I'm smart, it's not because I'm so smart, because, you know, it's just uh, the popularity. So um, I would do land flipping for the next five to 10 years still. And uh, I think eventually it will become like houses. You know how hard it is to get a house deal and uh, eventually land will be like that. Right. Yep. And um, uh, maybe I'll be homeless again after five to 10 years. Who knows? Right. <laughs> the land is gone. Now I don't know what to do. Right. So I, I think I would uh, probably do something else by then. But still, right now, it's still the best time. We had a question. So you got to see Pardon the Disruption live at Family Mastermind. One of our questions the week before the live episode was, what area in real estate has the most untapped potential? And and I gave Steve and, and CJ a hard time because their answer was 
to work direct to agent and, you know, have the agents bring you the houses and this and that. And I said, no, absolutely not. The area in real estate that has the most untapped potential is raw vacant land. Absolutely. It, that's, it's the, because it's that's, not sexy. Yeah. Yeah. That That's when I fall in love with you at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, Ray, I mean, let's be honest. This is the, the, the part of, of real estate that I feel like you'll never run out of a job. Like you said, hey, uh, five to 10 years from now, we don't know. But as cities like DFW, if we just take DFW, I've lived here my whole life. Okay. Mm. We just go like this. Absolutely. It just keeps going further and further out. There's no sign of that stopping anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. what? why is it ever going to stop? There's more people coming. The population continues to grow. They keep trying to get to the bigger cities. At this point, we are now building large cities inside of what used to be like, hey, you didn't even go to Frisco, Texas. Now Frisco, Texas has essentially a mini cowboy stadium where the cowboys practice. It's got the malls. It's got the Ikeas and the stars practice out there. And everything is now in Frisco, Texas. That used to just be country. It was just cornfields. Now mm -hmm. it's a city. So for me, that's what I see. I couldn't agree more with your strategy. Um, and I just, I love how simple, every time I interview somebody that does vacant land, you guys make it seem so simple. It you is simple. Like, hey, we just yeah. send out direct mail and offer 50% of what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. So only in Dami Dami can do land. <laughs> <laughs> That's so simple. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah. I love it. Well, for the people that are, are listening, they want to learn more about you. Where can they find more about you and your journey and kind of follow along? Uh, I have an Instagram, and there the um, name is Virtual Flip Land. So easy. Virtual flip land, okay. one word, and uh, you know, any questions, let me know, and uh, I'm happy to to help with a fee. You know, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. man, I love it, Ray. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on here, man, sharing your your journey, and and honestly, talking about something that I don't think we talk enough about, which is flipping vacant land, um, specifically those infill uh, lots and. Hey, man, uh, maybe I need to come down there and sell you some land in Jacksonville. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. Appreciate yeah. you. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you give us a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. And by the way, I just want to throw this out there. This is the first time this has ever happened. I forgot my belts. I can't <laughs> believe this. I took them to Family Mastermind. They're still in the suitcase because I took them home, right? Because I flew back in. I, they're in the suitcase. And I halfway through the interview, you got to go back and look at my face. I looked at the corner. I was like, I forgot my belt. So, yeah. Ray. The it's stuff, okay. Yeah, whoever complained. It's only on you because we forgot the belt. No worries. If whoever complained about that, you have the ox, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love okay. it. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you all next week.